This is Ed Driscoll with PJMedia.com, and we're talking with David Galerner, the professor of computer science at Yale University and the author of the new book, America Light, How Imperial Academia Dismantled Our Culture and Ushered in the Obamacrats. It's published by Encounter Books and available from Amazon.com and your local bookseller. And David, thank you for stopping by today. Thank you. Good to be here. I must say, I really enjoyed America Light, but its title may not fully explain the scope of the book. You've given us a whirlwind tour of American intellectual history in the last 100 years. Your book begins with two quotes that may be little known to many readers. As you write in the book, quote, Before the Cultural Revolution, America was assumed to be a Christian or Judeo-Christian society. As Britain struggled against Nazi Germany in 1940, President Roosevelt said in a radio address, quote, Today the whole world is divided between human slavery and human freedom, between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal, unquote. And in 1957, William Devane, then the dean of Yale, praised the character of America's leaders in politics, the arts, science, and academia, and praised the fruits of American culture itself. At the risk of sounding like Wallace Shawn in The Princess Bride, is it safe to say that it's inconceivable for a man in either position to publicly utter such positions today? Yeah, I think the sad thing is that it is inconceivable. Um, You know, with respect to the FDR quote, when he says we're we're looking at the the world under Nazi uh, domination and Asia under the domination of the brutal Japanese empire— we're seeing paganism versus our own Christian, Judeo-Christian values. Um, that, that would still be true today as far as this nation. This nation is still a Judeo-Christian nation. That's what we are. That's what we were designed to be. This is a biblical republic. But I don't know of any president, uh, n- n- no president would have, the, uh, would, have, would have the necessary guts to say that today. Um, Although it remains true, I don't think it is true of Europe anymore. I mean, Europe used to be part of this Judeo-Christian world, and uh, and and no longer is. As far as Devane's comment, uh, you know, there there isn't anything especially important in itself. It it's just indicative of a mood that was so striking in the in the generation after the Second World War. Um, all the way up to the early 1960s, when somebody like Devane, who was a dean at you know, one of the prominent culture uh, uh, makers, movers, big shots in American culture, could look around and say, uh, we ought to take pride in where we are. Our schools are first rate. Our professors are devoted. Our sciences and our arts are, and our engineering are models for the whole world. We're, we're, we're justifiably proud by where we are and what we have achieved as a nation. Uh, nobody would say that today because there, uh, there are no grounds for that sort of pride any longer. And, and the question is how, how a nation is, as, as extraordinarily wealthy, as rich in, in resources, as rich in every, every sort of resource as we are, how we could have lost that pride and that confidence and that excellence. We didn't just lose the pride, we lost the excellence of which to be proud, and we lost it within living memory. Uh, The early 1960s, a couple of generations ago, have still not slipped over the horizon. Many people, many people, many older people remember when this country held itself to vastly higher standards than we're satisfied with today. What happened? That's what the book, the question the book asks. Beyond the quotes from FDR in 1940 and the Dean of Yale in the 1950s, another detail early in America light may dramatically change how we view the history of 20th century American intellectuals. Most people are familiar on some level with the isolationist right in America on the eve of World War II. Why aren't we as familiar with the numerous prominent liberal intellectuals? You know, I think it's a very good question and a tremendously important point. People ought to know. Uh, Some people have heard of Charles Lindbergh and the American firsters saying, no, we don't want to go to the rescue of England or Britain. We don't want to fight Nazi Germany. This is not our fight. Um, However, as you say, many prominent left-wing intellectuals 
uh, especially the group around partisan review in New York, which was really the center of the American intelligentsia in those years, said, this is not our war, exactly like Charles Lindbergh. They said, this has nothing to do with us. Hitler has nothing to do with us. This is a fight between imperialist Germany and imperialist Britain. They're both equally uninteresting and unworthy of being saved, and we want to stay right out of it. Uh, now, you know, that in, 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 in the longer view, that's the way intellectuals generally react to events like this. It's exactly the same thing they said about Vietnam, and it's exactly the same thing they said about Iraq. But we have to remember it's not as if they have a record of distinguishing between what is traditionally called a good war and a far more complicated war. Their view was as naively, naively ignorantly, amorally pacifist in the face of Nazi bestiality. The left was just as pacifist and uninterested in the moral questions as the far right. And, and, and you know, you also said, why don't we know that? I, I, I think the answer is important because historians don't want us to know it. You know, the, the, the profession of historians is part of the humanities scholarship today. It has been taken over by intellectuals. Intellectuals don't want to give themselves a bad name. Intellectuals don't want you to know the history of how the intelligentsia has acted and what it has done for this country. Intellectuals are a left-wing interest group interested in promoting their own worldview and suppressing facts that are, uh, that are, that are negative. And uh, they teach what they want us to know. And there is a whole lot that our children, our students, are not learning because they're not being taught because the facts are being suppressed and withheld on purpose. David, you mentioned intellectuals in Vietnam a moment ago. Another topic explored in America Light is the symbiotic relationship between the liberal intellectuals who dreamed up America's role in the Vietnam War and the liberal intellectuals who opposed it. And as you write, opposition to Vietnam essentially predates the war itself, not the other way around. How is that possible? It's an interesting thing. Many people, when they look at um, uh, modern American cultural history, they say, sure, it's, uh, it's a more... It's a more left-wing world, a world that cares less about duty and devotion and patriotism, more about uh, a, a sort of blanket neutral tolerance for everybody and everything. Things have changed, and a lot of people said, well, it's Vietnam. You know, the, the war in Vietnam turned the country upside down and, and, and made us alter direction, but that is not so. Uh, the war, opposition to the war was, uh, was a result of a cultural revolution that had already begun to happen. I mean, we know the so-called new left, everybody who has looked at the era of Vietnam is familiar with this phenomenon. The new left, who we associate with the hippies and the yippies and Abby Hoffman and, and Jerry Rubin and many of the uh, uh, Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda and that sort of person. Um, the new left that, that, that led the, uh, the, the mass demonstrations against the war in Vietnam, as opposed to the old left, the old left being communists. Um, these, the, the Jane Fonda and Tom Haydens were more or less as Marxists, as they, but, but, but no longer wanted to call themselves communists. But the interesting thing is that this opposition had begun to organize well before anybody in the United States has heard of Vietnam. The, the so-called Port Huron Statement is a famous event in the creation of the new left in which uh, Tom Hayden and his friends sit down and say, we can't stand this country. We college students know a better way to do it. This country is corrupt and its values are no good and so forth. That, that happened in 1962. In other words, American advisors in Vietnam in 1962 and in, and in Laos and in all sorts of other countries, but there was no war in Vietnam in the sense that we know of it today, that war heated up in, in 1965. So, and, and if we look even back to the 1950s, we find leading intellectuals such as Norman Mailer um, writing in, in, in a vein of uh, destructive, violent bitterness against this nation, the destructive, violent bitterness, the idea of uh, what we have to do is tear this nation apart because this nation doesn't deserve to be proud of itself. Those ideas uh, came first. 
Then the war in Vietnam showed up and, and, and was opposed by these people who had already decided that this nation was not worth standing up for. And I have one more question about the backstory of America Light before we take things up to the present day. Your book also explores the religious aspects of the revolution in American intellectuals in the 20th century, referencing both what you described as self-hating wasps and the role of Jews who were both excluded from the academy during the first half of the century and vital to its transformation in the second half of the 20th century. Is that a correct assessment of that portion of your book? Absolutely. Um, you know, it is uh, Norman Podhart, one, um, one, the, one of our nation's leading thinkers today and one of the creators of, of modern conservatism who said, um, uh, clarity is courage. Uh, that is, if you want to be, if, uh, have have the have the nerve, have the honesty, to be uh, clear about what what you are saying and what is happening. Uh, American Jews are um, were the beneficiaries of the uh, tolerance, the new the newly tolerant attitude of American colleges and universities after the Second World War, elite colleges, the Yales and Harvards and Stanfords, were bigoted institutions before the war. Uh, they didn't want Jews. They certainly didn't want blacks. They weren't that fond of Catholics, for that matter. They were bigoted institutions, and their move to, um, towards tolerance was unquestionably a beautiful move in the American tradition. And at first, everything went beautifully. However, uh, it, it is in fact the case that what happened to these institutions is that they were taken over by intellectuals. The intelligentsia has always been a group that has held itself in opposition to the United States, hostile to Judeo-Christian values, especially hostile to the Bible, especially hostile to religion, but hostile to the idea of patriotism, hostile to the idea of duty, devotion, loyalty to the country intellectuals, the intelligentsia, took over Yale and Harvard and Stanford, and not, not as a result of conspiracy. I mean, they just, the, the gates were open. The university said, we want the, uh, we want the people who care the most about uh, the intellectual tradition and score the highest on their tests and, and, uh, and are perhaps the smartest. And those people flooded in, and it turned out that a lot of them were intellectuals. A lot of them were members of the when you, what you might say, the card-carrying intelligentsia. Uh, just as American Jews have been leaders in, the, uh, in, in modern conservatism, they were certainly leaders in, uh, in, in pushing the American cultural establishment to the left. They did that not insofar as they were Jews, but insofar as they were intellectuals. But American Jews need to understand the, uh, the crucial, the central role that they have played in a cultural transformation of this country, which in many ways has been catastrophic. And I think the same goes for wasps. Um, uh, wasps, who uh, the, the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, who built these institutions originally, uh, back beginning in the 17th century, who built the institutions, who, who, who gave the money, who donated the buildings, who gave the books and the collections, and staffed these colleges and served on the boards and, and uh, were the fundraisers and built these institutions, ran them, uh, ran them competently, although on an on a intolerant, bigoted basis. Nonetheless, they didn't do a lot of harm. Right up through the end of the Second World War, uh, m many of, j just, just as the, um, uh, the, 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 the self-hating Jew who, uh, rather than being proud of who he is, proud of the Jewish religious and cultural tradition, takes out his hostility and bitterness, not only uh, towards uh, uh, Jews and Judaism, but towards the United States, where he happens to live. Self-hating Jews are well-known. Self-hating wasps are not as well-known, but we need to understand that many of the leaders of the left-wing cultural revolution, the cultural revolution that, that made us no longer proud of this country, that made it impossible for a president to say, we are a Judeo-Christian nation, that made it impossible for the dean of Yale to look around this country and say, we ought to be proud of who we are and what we are and what we built, 
the leaders of the Cultural Revolution that uh, that, that that created this disastrous change included prominent self-hating wasps who were embarrassed about who they were, who were who, who, who hated the role they had played in creating this country, creating this institution. The McNamaras and the Lowells and the McGeorge Bundys, these were uh, uh, members of the wasp aristocracy whose hostility and bitterness towards their own cultural achievements matched the hostility and the bitterness of self-hating Jews towards the Jewish cultural achievement. There's a lot more similarity between those two groups than has been admitted, and the whole topic hasn't been studied as it should be. Or, I don't know if we studied, it hasn't been discussed, hasn't been acknowledged the way it should be. The history of American intellectuals from the 1940s through the 1960s makes up the backstory of America Light, and that's a topic we could devote the whole interview to. But David, since I know your time is limited, I definitely want to bring things up to the present day. What is Barack Obama's role in America Light? He is America Light. Um, he's, the, he's the perfect hero, the perfect superhero of America Light. He embodies everything that today's cultural elite stands for, um, uh, starting with ignorance and, and, and continuing with uh, prefab ideas that you were taught instead of having to reach yourself. Ideas as political furniture, pre-built-ins that you never had to go out and worry about. Your mind is furnished by your education with uh, an automatic view on every subject. You don't have to worry about reasoning for yourself. You just wake up and you find them there. I mean, after all, this man uh, has degrees from Columbia and from Harvard, the, 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 the creme de la creme, the elite of the elite of American schools. Uh, he's always uh, associated with and identified himself with intellectuals, been strongly supported by intellectuals, never dirtied his hands in the private sector or what you might call the, uh, uh, the non-ivory tower part of life, um, always been associated with, uh, w- with the intelligentsia and with the left. Um, represents perfectly, uh, is the perfect hero of these people. And the point is not so much what makes him distinctive as what makes him typical. There are, there are many thousands. I mean, he's certainly very smart and very articulate. He isn't typical in that respect, but there are many, many like him who have been educated, who have come out of these same institutions, the Columbias and the Harvards, with exactly the same views, not because they reached the views themselves, by struggling with the opposition and trying to figure out for themselves what the right way was, but because all their teachers from, from childhood up have had exactly the same view on nearly everything and have pumped that view into class after class of children. And what do you get at the other end? You get a country full of Barack Obamas. You get, or rather, you get a cultural elite. You get a cultural elite dominated by Barack Obamas. David, you have several interviews posted by a website called BigThink.com at YouTube, and I wanted to ask you about two of them, as they dovetail remarkably well with some of the themes in America Light. One of the interviews has had over 56,000 views, 549 likes, and 5,025 dislikes as of the time of this interview. That was on the topic of the danger of crusading atheists. Whatever could you have said to upset the legendarily tolerant and articulate crowd of YouTube commenters? Oh, the danger of crusading atheists. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, atheists, I, atheists might not be... I, I, I think the cultural elite today probably doesn't deserve to be called atheists. I mean, atheists suggest that you have considered and rejected religious views. These people have no concept of what religious views are. So I, you know, they're 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 post atheist, um, post religious as I call them in this book, uh, post religious globalist intellectuals. Yeah, they um, the the fact that this country is a biblical republic, the fact that the ideas of of, of freedom and democracy and equality came right out of the Bible, the fact that it was sermons to which the population listened. Not only the Puritans, but the Anglicans, the Catholics, the Jews, they listened on Sunday or, 
where Saturday indicated to you this is what molded the colonial personality. It was the preachers. It was the religious culture of this country. It wasn't uh, Enlightenment philosophy. Nobody read philosophy then any more than they read it today. This country emerged from the Bible. This is the biblical republic par excellence, as, as, as our greatest founding father, Abraham Lincoln, our last and greatest, saw so clearly in the greatest address in American history, the second inaugural address, which is exactly a sermon, which is a, a sublimely beautiful sermon in which Lincoln says, this war is God's punishment of the North and the South equally for the sin of slavery. This is at the center of our political life. Uh, we are a profoundly biblical, profoundly Judeo-Christian nation. Uh, that's just the way it is. That, that's, that's history. Those are the facts. And a lot of people don't like to hear them, but uh, and certainly my, my colleagues in uh, my colleagues at Yale and in, let's say, you know, academia generally don't, don't want to hear this. But it's true. Also, in another interview with BigThink.com, this one on the topic of the future of computing and the Internet, in a theme that ties in with the conclusion of America Light, you casually mentioned that, quote, I think that universities as we know them will be dead in 10 or 15 years. That's quite a dramatic charge for a Yale University professor. How do you see higher education changing in the next decade? Um, I, I think it's going to have to change dramatically. And, and I would say that um, certainly some institutions will survive. Uh, the Yales and the Harvards, the Oxfords, the Cambridges, the Stanfords don't deliver very much education. Well, they do in technical fields, in science and technology, but in the humanities, in the center of the university, they're doing very little educating. On the other hand, the prestige of their degrees really uh, buys something, um, you know, when you're looking for a job. And so they charge a lot of money, but they deliver a product that's worth something. But most, most universities have to get by on the strength of the education they deliver, and most universities are delivering none virtually none, and um, students who pay enormous sums of money and parents often who, who help them or, or, or who pay are noticing that, they're, that their children and the students know, know when they're being uh, um, phonied. They know, what's, they know what's phony. They don't have to pay uh, to listen to uh, uh, politically charged nonsense in the humanities and social sciences, not when the Internet offers such a convenient solution, not the perfect solution. I'd much rather learn face-to-face -face than over the Internet. But the Internet is a solution, and, and, and the product is so defective and is so grossly expensive. I mean, the two together mean that we are, are certainly going to see how the, 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 the defectiveness and overpricedness of the product combined with the Internet alternative means that things are certainly going to change. David, last question. In your recent interview with Hugh Hewitt, Hugh described the tone of America Light as a rather gloomy prognosis for the nation. Is it too late for conservatives to wrest the culture back from the left? And if so, where does America go from here? Um, Hugh Hewitt is absolutely great, but I don't think it's really gloomy. I mean, I, <laughs> there's certainly gloomy part of the book. But the conclusion is, is as upbeat as I could possibly make it, because this nation has been in worse trouble than this before. I mean, if you look at what, where this nation stood in, uh, in early 1942, when we were losing a war to the Japanese and we didn't, have any, we didn't have any weapons with which to fight, and we were being thrown back on every front, or a decade earlier when we were facing a genuine depression and we didn't know what to do to the economic system to make it work again, We've got through much worse times than this. We will get through these times so long as we open our eyes and take an active role and don't just let it all slide by. We'll get out of it. This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we've been talking with David Galerter of Yale, the author of the new book, America Light, How Imperial Academia Dismantled Our Culture and Ushered in the Obamacrats. It's published by Encounter Books, and available from Amazon.com and your local bookseller. And David, thank you once again very much for stopping by today. My pleasure, and thank you.